Uh, I let them know what we're gonna be, you're going to be talking about already. Okay. Um, so, and uh, in most, in normal years, right, absent last year and this year, we would have by now or next week interacted with Scott and a number of other DEC fisheries biologists, hatchery um, folks up at the Salmon River Hatchery, but that can't happen because the hatchery is not open to visitors, period, much less or, or vice versa. Uh, so we can't do that, right? But hopefully next year, um, and uh, all of you will potentially be around because nobody's a senior and about to graduate, so even though you can do it with this class, we'll, if we can make that happen, I'll open it up and, and broadly see if anybody else is interested and, and get you to be able to do that, hopefully. But that's out of our control. But anyway, that's where we would normally do some stuff. Maybe up at the Nida Hatchery. You don't spend much time there, do you? In the spring? I don't. You don't? Jim, but, uh, Jim Ember does that. Okay. Yeah, Jim Emberard is another one who somehow we didn't see Jim on the lake at all because Jim eats, sleeps, and breathes fish all the time. <laughs> so um, so yeah. questions, questions throughout okay? Yes. All right. And then, um, and then, or you can save your questions at the end, but go ahead and ask them throughout. And then um, for anybody who is able to, uh, Scott, I, and several of you already said to give over to uh, sit down and have some lunch. Talk to Scott, ask some questions uh, for as little or as long as you're able to. I know everybody's busy. I'll hang out for as long as you care to chat, but okay. Okay. All right. All right. So I'm Scott Brindle. I work for the New York Department of Environmental Conservation as a fisheries biologist. Uh, just to give you some background information, I grew up in Hamilton, went to Morrisville College, got an associate's there before they had a bachelor's program, went to Oswego, got a bachelor's, and then ESF for a master's degree. So I'm just going to share with you guys a little bit about what do I do for a job. Maybe it'll spur some interest in you folks who might want to pursue this as a uh, career avenue. Um, otherwise, it'll just be hopefully an interesting and entertaining hour. So I'm going to be talking about fisheries management and also how the careers in fish and wildlife are tied into this sort of thing. Wildlife, uh, many of the same techniques, principles, everything is um, pretty consistent between fish and wildlife. So. Yeah, so a lot of stuff I talk about is directly related to wildlife as well. Management, so our mission statement is pretty simple. It's conserve and enhance New York State's abundant and diverse population of freshwater fish while providing the public with quality recreational opportunities. Easier said than done. The biggest challenge we have as a management agency is, is taking care of and trying to balance uh, expectations from the anglers and also hunters as well. And just an example here, um, when we're dealing with like lake associations and angler groups, they typically want every type of fish in great abundance in every single lake in the, in the area. And a lot of times it's just simply not feasible. You can't have everything everywhere. Some water bodies are uniquely, um, their characteristics are such that they can only have certain types of fish in them. You know, be it trout, some of them are just too warm. You have bass and bluegills. You guys have sampled a bunch of those ecosystems. So as an example, on the right-hand side there, you've got this graph. And you can see that this lake has got some issues going on. Um, once you get down to the bottom, the dissolved oxygen is way below anything that would support fish life. So really, and then up here where you do have halfway decent oxygen, which is the circles, um, it's really, really warm. So this would not be a case where trout would survive the summertime. So this is a, a lake or an ecosystem that could not have everything of everything because once your water temps get down into where trout would be happy, the dissolved oxygen is not sufficient. So again, trying to relay that and get that across to anglers is quite often difficult. They, they, uh, they don't want to hear it and causes uh, great frustration on so some of what we do, our primary mission is to manage fisheries. We do this through several means. Uh, one of the primary ones is regulations. Um, by doing that, we manage populations. We can put bag limits, size limits, seasons, um, all sorts of things to try to protect and enhance the population. The way we come about or get to the regulation portion is by doing surveying fish populations. Obviously, before we do any kind of management activity, we need to know what's going on in the lake or stream. So it would allow us to figure out what the best avenue was to put forth regulations that hopefully will make a difference. So you go out and 
survey a lake or a stream and, and realize that, geez, there's a lot of really, really young ones out there. The bigger ones are getting cuffed off. You know, maybe we might want to put in a minimum size limit to help get the age structure built up where it should be to help keep a sustainable population. Another thing we do as far as management goes is stocking. Um, a lot of our waters around here get intense angling pressure and they simply cannot support itself based on natural reproduction. So we go and enhance that through stocking. Uh, primarily this is trout streams, but we also do other things like um, walleye and some of the warm water species. Another thing we'll do, which we'll talk about here, all these we'll touch on individually as we go along, but sea lamprey control, that's a parasitic fish that actually preys on other fish. It's not native to the inland waters and it really wreaks havoc when it gets in there and gets established. Occasionally we investigate fish kills. Thankfully this isn't very often. Uh, habitat protection, we get involved in permitting bridge projects or if someone wants to do a seawall, we get involved with that. We come up with ideas and, and criteria to carry it out with the least uh, amount of environmental impact. And assist public and outreach, we do a lot of that. Field calls from anglers, pond owners, um, farmers, the whole gamut asking questions about how to do things and just seeking input about what they're going to be doing on a project. And we do sample fish for toxicology, toxicology analysis. Um, basically that involves when we go out and do a survey. If there hasn't been anything done recently, we capture a bunch of fish send them off to our toxicology lab, which runs the analysis looking for things like heavy metals and pesticides and all the other nasty stuff that we should be aware of in our food source. They run the analysis and provide that to the State Department of Health and they come up with fish consumption advisories based on the information that we provide. And lastly, public access. That's one of my big things. I do all the public access stuff in our nine county region. Keeps me pretty busy uh, dealing with boat launches and angler parking areas and public fishing rights. So touch, swing back to fishing regulations. That's our primary tool for uh, fish biologists to use to manage populations. The goal is to provide the kind of fishing that satisfies most anglers while maintaining a, a you know, level of protection for the environment. Um, obviously anglers would love to catch just pickup truckloads all the time, but that's not obviously in the best interest of the population or is it sustainable. So we try to spread out the, spread everything out to give the maximum number of people, the maximum amount of enjoyment, basically. So regulations cover a myriad of things. Um, species, some species, in fact, the majority of our species we have in the state don't have any regulations at all. You can catch them anytime, anywhere, any number. Um, but there are ones that are particularly popular that do get you know, more focused attention and are more susceptible to issues of the population. Um, some of our regulations are open and closed seasons. Some of our populations that are particularly vulnerable to spawning, interruptions or perturbations by anglers. Um, we would close the season during the time when they're spawning to give them a little respite and let them do their thing so that they can hopefully, uh, obviously our goal is to have complete natural reproduction. That way we don't have to spend time and money raising fish, but it's not realistic. Uh, minimum lengths, again, when we're doing population assessments, if we go into a stream or a lake and see that the the size distribution is really skewed one way or another. We may put in a minimum length on there to give the fish a chance to grow to the point where usually we're looking for hopefully one or two um, spawning events out of a fish before they you know, get yanked out of there for a harvest. Daily limit again, that's to protect the population and also to spread out the harvest. You know, there's some guys that, retired guys or whatever that know what they're doing and really can clean out a water body quick if, if they're given a free for all on it. So we want to make sure it's equitable for everyone. Method of take, obviously um, we limit that, you know, you're not using dynamite and clubs. Um, we do have some spots that are fly fishing only. So we re-regulate uh, method of take. That's primarily to regulate human um, expectations. License requirements, obviously anyone under, under 16 doesn't need one, 16 and over does with a few um, exceptions. And then just the general regulations, you know, you shouldn't use a club, use a hook and a line, that sort of thing. Bait fish regulations, we cover that. Um, 15 years ago or so, we had a really nasty virus come through the state and wiped out a bunch of our fish. Um, so since then, in order for anglers to use bait fish, which are live fish that they put on a hook and use to 
catch predatory fish. The fish that they use, if they don't come to that from that water body itself, have to be tested for a whole suite of diseases to make sure they're healthy. Because obviously, if you are using a bait fish from a lake that has, you know, BHS, which is the really nasty one that I was just talking about, and they start using that at all the places they ice fish, you know, then you're introducing that virus to a whole bunch of lakes, and that's obviously not a good thing. And then just special regulations. So as I mentioned, everyone over 16 needs a license. Uh, the funds from the licenses go directly back into fisheries. It's maintaining, building hatcheries, feeding the fish in the hatchery, uh, paying my salary. Um, so it's it's money well spent, and it's you know it's basically you're paying for a, a service. Fish sampling, that's the fun part of the job, and that's why most of us that are in it got into it. It's not to put up with a grumpy public, but to play with fish all day. So we use a, a variety of techniques to do our assessments on lakes, ponds, and streams. Gill nets are used on lakes and ponds. These are, you guys haven't done, covered much of this? Uh, I don't think we did gill nets. Okay. So gill nets are basically a long curtain. They can be a thousand feet long at some times. Curtain in the water. It looks like a hockey or a soccer net. Diamond-shaped meshes. Uh, they have a float line on top, rope, which keeps, and then a weighted line on the bottom. It keeps it upright in the water column. The fish swim along the body or the bottom of the lake, encounter the mesh, and they stick their head in, and they get caught behind their operculum, and they're, they're captured, and then you bring them up. You can see in the upper right hand corner there's a bunch of fish that got caught. Uh, the nice thing about gill nets is they can be set in virtually any depth of water which makes it sort of unique for a sampling technique. Um, you can go down, you can set nets 150 feet down if you wanted to. You can also suspend gill nets mid column in the water. It's difficult to do and doesn't happen very often but it is possible. And the other nice thing about gill nets is you have these long nets, but you can have individual panels in the net with differing size mesh. So you can conceivably catch everything from little shiners up to um, lake sturgeon in a 7 inch, 10 inch mesh. Yep? How many um, fish on average do you catch with using the gill net at once? Like is it varied? Or in, in a really productive lake, it could be hundreds. Um, we were out here on CAS two weeks ago, I think, and we, we had eight nets. And I think we caught 75 fish out of the eight nets, so it was a fairly light catch. So it varied. Yep. And you can also, like if we're going after lake sturgeon, you know, we would just set one mesh, the 10 inch, the really big mesh for lake sturgeon, because we're not interested in catching all the little stuff. So you can do an entire net of that. So it's, it's a really adaptive and, and more or less species specific, you want it to be um, technique for catching fish. Sir, for lake sturgeon, how big of a mesh do, do they use typically? I think it's 10 or 12. It's a really? big mesh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So anyway, yeah, the advantages are you can set it at multiple depths and you can get a really good community estimate because you can have varying you know, meshes in there and catch the little guys all the way up to the big guys. Predator and prey. Boat electrofishing, we primarily do this in lakes and rivers. Gill nets are very difficult in lakes and rivers because obviously you're dealing with flowing water, so you've got everything that's coming downstream with the water, leaves, logs, twigs, everything, boats, um, can seriously compromise a gill net. So it's not something we typically use on lakes and rivers. However, we do have this technique. Um, so we're in a boat. It's got a generator on board and actually conducts electricity into the water. I always, it's even mentioned here, it tem temporarily stuns the fish, but I more or less being tased. It's not a pleasant experience. People, oh, does it hurt the fish? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it does. They don't like it. Um, but on the plus side, they recover almost immediately um, with no visible uh, issues. So that is a good non-lethal technique. A good exam question might be, you know, which one of these techniques is lethal and which one is not? Yes. <laughs> this one's non-lethal. This one's non, lethal. yes. How Most exactly are gill nets lethal? Because they get tangled up in the net, and quite often it involves their gills. They will struggle, and, and obviously if their gills are being impacted, they have a tough time respiring. So, yeah, they basically suffer from that. Is there, because like I know... Not said, all the time, and we do get some that... I know you survive. said it's really good because it can be used in like any depth of water. Is there other techniques that are used over it? 
because it's legal, or? We try not to use gill nets unless we have to, for that very reason, because it's a bad look. It's just the environmental agency. We shouldn't be out there killing tons of fish. So we don't do gill nets a lot. And if we do a lake, you know, we don't do it like every single year, several times. So we kind of use it as needed, but we prefer the other techniques because they are non-lethal. We just are processing the fish, put back in the water, and everybody's happy. So, but there are occasions like the boat electric fishing on the lakes and rivers. That really is our only means of, of doing an assessment because you know there's such having to deal with the current is uh, really a big impediment. Stream electric fishing surveys, again, this is our primary means of doing trout surveys for the very reason I discussed before. Any kind of net just does not work in a stream. Uh, our primary method is for trout stream management. We do evaluations of populations, again, to look at what's going on in the stream. Therefore, we can adjust stocking rates up or down. We've had lots of cases where the natural reproduction is such that uh, we just stop stocking. The thing is doing well on its own, so we don't need to put fish there. And conversely, if you know there's not a lot of fish and gets a lot of angling pressure, we might consider bumping up the stocking rates. When we're doing stream electric fishing surveys and tying into this whole management um, idea, we also look at other things in the water because it's not just the fish. We got to look at what else is going on there to determine carrying capacity. If we're doing a stream survey and we're looking at three invertebrates and the thing is a sterile environment, obviously that's not going to support a whole lot of fish. So we need to take that into consideration when we're considering how many fish we stock in the stream. We also do habitat measurements, um, lengths of pools, depths of pools, um, those sort of things, cobble, what the, what the substrate looks like, the discharge, again, the physical habitat measurements, that's lengths, width, depths, and the water chemistry as well. If we got really nice, cool water temperatures in the middle of the summer, great DO, you know, that's something that would be obviously a uh, highly desirable for trout and could support a lot of trout and therefore we would manage it as such. Uh, just a couple pictures here, the one in the upper right hand corner, they are stream electric fishing using backpacks. It's a similar arrangement as the boat, except there's either a battery or a generator on the, the frame that that gentleman's wearing. That conducts the electricity into the two wands that the two people in front. Um, you guys have done this already, right? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. So the electricity goes into the water, it stuns the fish, the fish roll up, and then behind them there'll be several people with nets to catch them as they'll roll up and start floating downstream. The people in the back catch them and throw them into a live car for processing. The photo on the bottom is still doing stream electric fishing, but this is a much bigger stream, so they're actually doing it out of a barge. You can see the blue barge there at the bottom. That has all the electric equipment in it, and then the yellow cords actually feed the dinner uh, electricity to the wands that are stunning the fish. This is just a collage of various uh, fisheries photos from the DEC. Up here, this is the RV Argo. That's our research vessel on Lake Erie. There's a sister ship on Lake Ontario, the um, Seth Green. The middle picture is just a walleye getting weighed on the... Uh, right hand side there, that's a hoop net, that's a non, another good non-lethal technique, um, but again, unlike gill nets, that's kind of relegated to fairly shallow water, like 10, 15 feet at the most, but it is non-lethal. It's basically a series of hoops that has a funnel on the inside, a net funnel that starts out really wide and then it tapers down to an opening about yay big, and then there's a series of those, so the fish go through and then once they get in there, they can't figure out how to get back out the hole. So it's a really effective way to catch fish, and again, it's non-lethal. You just dump them out into a water tub, you do your process, and you chuck them back. So it works good. Pretty easy and effective way. The bottom corner here, these are seines. That's the most basic fisheries assessment tool we have. It's, basically, it's a lot like a gill net, except it's got much smaller mesh. And you actually, gill net's a passive gear. This would be considered an active gear. That would be a good exam question. <coughs> um, so pe two people on either end of the seine, they just pull it through the water and then they go a set amount of distance and they wrap around towards shore and kind of herd the fish in and they dump them into a bucket and you've got, they're really, this is really good for catching small young year fish. And then the last photo, this is on Lake Ontario, this is on the Seth Green. Um, this is called a trawl. It's a giant net that they drag through the middle of the water column that they catch. These are alewife, which are a pelagic or open water prey species in Lake Ontario. And this is the one of the ways we assess that. 
because they are the prey for the trout and salmon that are in Lake Ontario, we need to know what's going on with them so we can adjust the numbers of trout and salmon in the lake. And that's actually me when I was doing the hat when I was working up there. So that's a tremendous catch of fish. So some of the other things we do as a management uh, agency and, and our tasks that we do every day to help us figure out what's going on is fish aging. This is a really big thing to kind of track what's going on in the water body. Um, we have known standards for how big a fish should be at a given length or a given age rather. So, you know, a five-year-old walleye in New York State should be X millimeters rather. And so we can look at the data we get from the individual water body, compare it to the New York State average. And if it's like way low, we can... Uh, we would probably cut back on stocking because the growth just isn't there and they're not a great balanced population. So fish are unique and they have indeterminate growth. They keep growing, although as they get older, their fish, their, their, uh, their growth typically slows down. Uh, so on the right, we have a fish scale. What happens is a lot like tree rings, or you've all seen tree rings, and you can count those and get the age. Uh, the same thing happens with fish. They, they lay down periodic rings when they're young you can actually see daily growth rings and then during the winter time of course they slow down their growth in winter time because you know cold temperatures slow down their metabolism so though during the winter time when it's cold those rings are really tight together because they don't grow much so that's an annular ring we count those to figure out how old the fish is so on this one i'm guessing this is a spring scale because you can see them bunched up around the edge. So this would be a one, two, could be a three-year-old fish. This is actually an ear bone out of a fish. It's called an otolith. These are nice because uh, older fish are much easier to age with an otolith because on, on scales you get you know, fish are rubbing up against um, rocks and vegetation. They're fighting with each other during spawning time. So these edges typically get eroded. So it's not the best technique of aging older fish. However, the otolith being buried in the head, of course, that's protected from all the stuff that could impact it. So you crack it in half, and then you can actually hold it over a flame to singe it a little bit, and you can see the all the annular. This is quite an old fish here. But that's, a, that's another way we do it. But the bad thing about otoliths is um, the fish, you have to sacrifice fish, obviously, to get the otoliths out. Where the advantage of the scales is you can take few scales off the fish, let it go, and everything, everybody's happy. So We don't do a whole lot of otoliths because they are so labor intensive and, you know, it's a lethal technique. So we really need to have a specific question rather than just, you know, we take scales off of everything, but not so much the otoliths. Fish marking studies, we do these to um, keep track of populations. Um, we can do fin clipping to do a population estimate actual, try to determine actually how many fish are in a given water body, be it, you know, we even do it on a lake, uh, an idle lake, which is, you know, a very large lake. We do every couple of years do walleye and yellow perch population estimates by doing fin clipping. So basically you clip a bunch of fish, you know how many you clipped, and when you go back and start doing your follow-up sampling methods, you, you take into account the ratio of the number you've caught that are clipped to the ones you aren't. You pitch that through a formula and it comes up with a, it'll spit out a rough estimate of how many fish are in a lake. We do this um, sometimes in streams too. Coated wire tags. This is a fairly labor intensive process, but it actually is pretty cool. It's a small, like the size of a pencil lead little chunk of metal. It has a number laser etched in it. You inject that in the snout of the fish. And the advantage there is um, you can actually uniquely mark even from one tank in the hatchery who get their own serial number. So when you caught it, you can know, oh, geez, you know, the ones in this tank did really well because we fed them Purina trout chow versus beacon feeds or whatever. The only bad thing about coated wire tags is you got to retrieve, obviously, the, the, the tag out of the snout, which means killing it. Um, although... The coated wire tags are metallic, so you can actually wand the fish and detect if there's a tag in there. You just you wouldn't be able to get the serial number off of them without killing the fish. Elastomer tags, we don't use this too much. It's actually a dye you inject in the face. Usually the cheek or the eye socket, and you can, they're 
half a dozen colors, you can differentiate your class based on that too. We don't use that very often though. Creel surveys, this is another method of doing fisheries management and getting information. Um, we use it to estimate angler effort. So when we're doing management decisions such as where we're gonna stock fish, um, it's good to know what kind of angler effort. I mean, if nobody's on a stream fishing, there's not a lot of impetus or reason to put, dump a bunch of extra fish in there. Whereas if we know a stream really gets hit hard, like Chittenango Creek, you know, we know that would be something that we would consider stocking more fish because you know there's going to be a lot of people utilizing it. Um, from creel surveys, we also get catch rates. So I should step back. A lot of the like gill nets in particular, um, when we're getting population information, we're not actually getting a, like a true number of fish. We're not trying to get the true number of fish in a lake or a stream. <coughs> we're going for a rate. So at Casanova Lake, we set the gill nets out there, we get a number of fish per net night. So that takes into account the number of nets and the number of nights they're out there. So by doing that repeatedly, in theory, you should be able to track the population. So if your number of fish per net night is going up, you can hopefully theorize that the population is doing better and vice versa if it's going down. We can do the same thing with creel surveys. The number of fish caught per hour by anglers is another metric we use to keep track of a population. So if the catch breed and effort of yellow perch is going down, that's a pretty good indicator that the population of yellow perch in the lake is also having problems. And we also get an idea of harvest as well by talking to the anglers. We basically call, we, we walk up and say, hey, how are you doing? How long have you been fishing today? That gives you the amount of time that they fished and then you get the number of fish they've caught. And then and what's your fish per hour, your fishing rate. We do the same thing for harvest. And it's also an opportunity to get quite a bit of biological data. So if we're gonna do a survey, a big intensive survey on say Whitney Point Reservoir, it may take four or five of us a week to do a really comprehensive survey. But that the upper corner here, that's Whitney Point Reservoir during their ice fishing derby. <coughs> so we can send a technician out there and interview 150, 200 anglers about what they caught, what size fish, and can measure the fish run the, when they're on the ice. It's a really good way to get a ton of information with a little bit of effort on our part. Angler diary cooperator, this is similar to creel surveys, except it's not direct contact. The person actually takes a diary with them and they keep track of their trips during the year. So it's, it's the same information that we would get if we were doing a direct contact creel survey, but it's just it's on the angler to record that information, the, the amount of time they spent fishing, what they caught, um, the size of the fish, whether they kept it or not. It's the same information, just in a different format. Fish propagation. <coughs> I tell people on the fisheries biologists, they automatically assume I work in a hatchery. I tell them, I don't know anything about raising fish other than you feed one end and it comes out the other. Um, I, obviously, I do management, so I would, we work with the hatcheries and basically going out and doing assessments and coming up with management policies. So the hatcheries know what to grow species-wise, numbers, where to put them, what time of year to put them, that sort of stuff. So we work hand in glove with the propagation folks in the hatchery to you know, produce the fisheries that uh, we enjoy in the state. We've got 12 hatcheries statewide, produce about a million pounds of fish annually, so it's a tremendous number. We have two types of hatcheries. We have cold water hatcheries, which raise trout and salmon, and we have cool water hatcheries, which raise our wall, walleye and tiger muskies. We also do dabble in threatened and endangered species like paddlefish and, and lake sturgeon, which has been a great success story. We raise those at our hatcheries as well for reintroduction. Stocking, this is the time of year when everybody loves the fish guys. Um, we don't get any complaints generally stocking days, so I like going out because everyone's happy to see me. Stocking is used to create or enhance a fishery. It's to increase fishing opportunity. Like I said, you get some of these streams like Chittenango Creek right over here that just gets a lot of angling pressure that can't sustain um, a natural fishery. By putting stocked fish in there, that just enhances the angler's experience, allows them to catch fish where Chances are it'd be pretty slim pickings if we didn't. We have do two types of stockings. One's called put and take. That is where we 
put fish into the water, say most of our inland trout around here that are that way. They go in like nine to 12 inches long. So we put them in the water and they're immediately the size that the anglers would be interested in catching and taking home. So we put them in the water and they're immediately ready to be taken. The other method is called put, grow and take. In that case, we do that primarily like on Lake Ontario, um, walleye, where you're putting in really, really small fish, you put them in the water. They take a couple years to grow to the size that anglers find desirable. So that's where the put grow and then eventually the fish comes in. And again, we work on reintroducing threatened or endangered species. So the top photo there, that's actually a, one of our stocking mm -hmm. trucks and they're netting fish out to take and dump in the water. The bottom one actually in Lake Ontario, we have problems with predatory birds that hang out near shore. So we actually load the stocking truck on a World War II landing craft, take it out into the lake and dump the uh, fish out there and it really limits the amount of predation and helps them survive a lot better because they're not getting pounded on shore by the birds like they would if you just dumped them right in the water off the truck. So these are some of the threatened and endangered species we work on and actually have raised in our hatcheries to help reintroduce or boost up the population of some native species. Sauger, they're a close relative of walleye. They were found in a few watersheds in New York State. Um, they weren't doing well. We've since kind of bolstered their populations. Lake sturgeon's been a tremendous success. Those were mostly non-existent, and now they're all over the place. We've got them in the Finger Lakes. There's ones in Oneida Lake that are pushing 200 pounds now, and they're starting to reproduce on their own. So that's been a tremendous success story. Bloater, the one in the upper uh, right corner there, those were a open water species in Lake Ontario. They got extirpated when alewives came in. It was a suppressed right now, so there's a move on to try to get bloater reestablished because it's a native prey species that occupies a niche that's currently not, not occupied. And paddlefish, those are really the cool prehistoric fish. They're actually native to the Allegheny watershed out in western New York. And so we're working on getting those reestablished as well because they were extirpated. Sea lamprey control, we do this a few times a year, and it's a pretty important task. Larval lamprey start out in streams and they'll spend three to five years in a stream interestingly just eating detritus leaf matter and organic stuff burrowed in the bottom they just look like little worms however once they transform into the adult stage they migrate downstream that's when they become piscivorous and they pretty nasty critters they're not native to the inland waters in new york state when they got in here through the canal system they wiped out the entire population of lake ontario salmonids they, they're in Lake Champlain, they're in several or Finger Lakes, and unchecked, they just decimate the fishery. So we have to treat for them in order to provide a you know, halfway decent fishery in those lakes. So just to go through some of the photos here. So these are the transformers. These are the ones that are getting ready to go down to the lake. They're really small. This is the mouth on a lamprey. It's actually called a buccal cavity. So it's a, you know, it's a round circular disc. These are all teeth. So the lamprey will go swim up to a fish, it'll attach that buccal cavity to the side of the fish and it'll clamp down, those teeth will obviously grab onto the side of the fish and then they're, they're, they have a tongue, a rasping tongue that has teeth on it too, so they'll sit there and they'll rasp a hole in the side of the fish and they feed off the bodily fluids of that fish. So this poor lake trout's um, not in good shape. So it doesn't always kill the host fish, but if it gets hit with enough of the lampreys or it gets you know, repeated ones, it can certainly cause mortality, and that was the issue with Lake Ontario. The lampreys were just uh, you know, unchecked, and they did their thing, and they just crashed the Cinnamonic population. So we go in and figure out where the lampreys are spawning in streams. We do assessments, realize, wow, there's a lot of lamprey in the stream. And we typically apply a chemical called TFM. There's a millions of dollars spent on this. This one chemical that's applied at the right dosage kills primarily just sea lampreys. So it's highly effective and highly selective for lampreys. Um, so we go in and we treat the stream to kill off the young lampreys, because obviously once they're in the lake, there's not much we can do about that. We are trying to work on alternative control techniques, such as pheromones, whereby you, you attract the seal lamprey into a trap and you can dispose of them that way. Barriers are another good method of trying to keep lampreys out of their spawning habitat. You put a barrier low down in a stream, the lampreys can't get over the barrier, therefore they can't spawn. So 
Obviously, we don't like putting chemicals in and it's very expensive, so we are trying to figure out alternative control techniques. Fish kills, thankfully, we won't have to do this very often. Um, we would be called in to determine what species there was, um, the number that were killed. Uh, typically, our spills folks take care of, you know, can we stop it and that sort of stuff. But we get called in, obviously, to handle the very specific fisheries questions. Because a lot of times, the penalties incurred upon the person who caused the fish kill or pollution are based on the number and species of fish. Years ago, we had a train derailment in Ithaca that dumped a bunch of diesel fuel in Cayuga Inlet, which is one of the, the main tributaries to Cayuga Lake. And the railroad actually got dinged for, I forgot what the, the price was, five or six dollars for every single rainbow trout we found. So it was a pretty substantial penalty. Habitat protection. Uh, we deal quite a bit with this. Based on our knowledge, uh, people put in a permit to do a driveway culvert or the town highway may be replacing the culvert. So our permits folks will come and ask us, okay, they're looking to do a culvert replacement on this stream. What kind of data do you have on the stream? Is it a good high quality trout stream or is it not? Is it just a warm water ephemeral stream? So it, what the stream is kind of depends on how we would handle situations. That's where we get called in to provide direction and advice <coughs> to the municipality, the person you know, requesting the permit. So we do that for both st uh, streams and lakes, and also we do with wetland stuff too. And yeah, so we assist in doing the permits and sometimes they're compliant. So you can see like this here is a highly, that's not a desirable situation. So that's the sort of thing we try to avoid by the whole permit process because generally folks who are left to their own devices will take the cheap and easy method and that is a cheap and easy method to uh, deal with a, I assume there's probably a gravel bar causing flooding there. Outreach, we do quite a bit of this. Um, things such as fishing clinics, the top one up here is actually in South Hot Sea Lake. We do a fishing day down there every spring. Get families and kids exposed to fishing, hopefully get them excited about Picking that up as a lifetime hobby, we go to sports shows, um, have booths there to talk to anglers and folks who are interested in fishing in New York, trying to get them interested and in coming here to spend money and spend time. We go to any uh, sportsmen's meetings, usually there's you know, rod and gun club, that sort of thing, just to talk about management proposals we may have, get in, input from them about concerns they have. And then obviously the big one is to provide technical advice pond owners got vegetation problems, they'll call up and try to seek advice from us. Fishing information, obviously what we do, we try to provide a good product out there for management and fish stocking and those sort of things. But in addition to that, we need to let people know, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's a great place to go fishing. And so we do a lot of that too. So we highlight places to go fishing what we stock and where, giving people an idea where to go. Hey, geez, they just stocked 8,000 brown trout in Chittenango Creek last week. Let's go there. And when they get there, they got to know where they can go for public fishing rights where they're allowed to fish. So there's just a lot of stuff that we put out there to give folks the opportunity to figure out where it'd be a good place to go legally and be happy. Public access, that feeds into uh, you know, kind of our outreach stuff. So we cover boat launches. We have number of boat launches around here, fishing piers, we don't have so many of those, and then, like I said, shore access sites, we have those as well. And public fishing rights easements, we try to get as many of those as possible. We'll approach a landowner and offer them a set amount of money depending on the distance of stream they have, and they enter into a public fishing rights easement, which is permanent e uh, access to the stream. It gets recorded in their deed and follows you know, every subsequent land transfer, which causes some strife. But because the new owners don't always think it's a great idea to have anglers in their backyard. So to get to the, sum this all up, as far as if you're interested in this sort of thing, just some beneficial personal characteristics that uh, we're looking for. Appreciation of the natural world. I assume you guys all have that because you're sitting here. And the acknowledgement that job appreciation is going to probably outweigh your economic gain. You're not going to make as much in this position or in this field as you would like a software engineer. Be a dedicated student. There's a lot of people going trying to go into this field because it is a lot of fun. Um, but 
you got to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff. So the cream does rise to the crop. So you know, keep your nose to the grindstone. Again, self-motivated, disciplined. You got to be patient. It does take, especially uh, you know, to get to like a bio level like I am. It takes a little while. And also the other thing is to be willing to move. I mean, if you're married to Casanova and don't ever want to leave here, your options are going to be a little bit tighter. It's going to be a little bit harder than if you're willing to go to you know, Ohio for a couple years and then come back, that sort of thing. So just be flexible and enjoy working with the public. I say that tongue in cheek. Uh, it's not quite this bad, but we always say it's 1% working the fish and 99% dealing with the public. It's not quite that bad. So some uh, things to think about, strong math and science backgrounds. You'll be sitting in classes here at school and thinking, oh, I'm never going to use this. You will use it, believe me, especially statistics. We use computers all the time, GIS, spreadsheets, stack packages. Another good one is public uh, people skills, public speaking. I tell everyone the best class I ever took all the way through college is oral presentation techniques. It's just singularly the most important class I took because you do have to get out there and talk to people, get input. And if you're up there stumbling, the ums and the uhs, and people are just like, they check out. Uh, supervision, that's something you just get with experience. So the degrees, uh, for a technician level job, which are more of the folks that are out in the field all the time playing with fish, it's frankly the more fun job. Uh, you need a minimum of a two year degree and a four year degree for a bio level where you're still in the field some, but you're dealing a lot more writing reports, crunching numbers and dealing with the public. Realistically though, to be competitive, you really have to have a four year degree for a tech and a master's for a bio. But there are some people that still um, get a bio job with a uh, bachelor's, but Generally, it's a trade-off between an advanced degree or a lot of experience. So it's kind of, you know, you might get in the same time, but it's just going in one avenue or another. This is important, too, to get into the state. You need to take a civil service exam. They are not given very often, so you don't want to miss them. They have a list serve. If you're interested in this sort of thing, I would encourage it just to keep your options open. Go on the civil service website, sign up for the list serve. Every time a group of exam announcements come out, they will email it right to your inbox. You don't have to worry about missing one. Missing one's a big deal, as I mentioned, every three to nine years. So if you really, really want to be a wildlife biologist, you do not want to miss that test. And along with that, the civil service exams, they may be 100 questions. 75 of them are pretty similar test to test, with 25 to 30 kind of specific to the job title. So when these exams come up, you think, ah, I don't want anything to do with pesticides. Take any exam you qualify for if you're, this is kind of like your job career aspiration. The more exams you take, the better you get. You become more comfortable. You know what to expect. So don't leave. If you want to be a wildlife bio, don't make that the first civil service exam you take because chances are you're going to be disappointed. So take all the tests you can. And it also benefits you from experience and making sure that you're you're up to speed when the one you want comes up. It also keeps your options open. You may be living in Plattsburgh, going, you know, you're unemployed, and then somebody calls up and says, hey, remember that test you took two years ago? Hey, we'd like to give you an interview. There you go. And once you're in the state, you can transfer around much easier to get the job you might ultimately want. Yes? Is there like a fee to take the exam? Typically, yes. They're not bad. It's like, I don't know, $20 or something like that. Yes, there's generally a fee. Experience, again, this goes along with just kind of setting yourself apart, first with grades, but then just make yourself known. You can't kind of sit in your dorm room and expect jobs that are going to plop in your lap. So do volunteer work. Um, like the bio blip, blips you guys just had, that's a good, that looks good on your resume. Do stuff like that. Get an internship with soil and water, um, us, the federal agencies, just get yourself known, get experience, get stuff that looks great on your resume and really pop. Yes. What are, like, do you go in and pay for stuff after you have your exam? Is that something that's available to us? Right now, other than volunteer, no. <laughs> Typically, the internships are during the summer because that's our biggest staff need. And then sometimes, obviously, it's warm and everything's unfrozen, so we're really hard at it then. How do you get involved with that? You can just contact. Um, are you from this area? or? I am in Western New York. Okay, so you probably want to, I mean, if you want to do it out of there, you contact either in the Buffalo area. Okay, so they have fisheries biologists, if you're interested in fish stuff, they have people in Buffalo and also down in Allegheny. Okay. So you just contact them and say, hey, I'm a Cass College student, 
Scott, who's an awesome guy, told me about. Anyway, I know the guys out there, but. Hmm? Wait, did the website identify my contacts for that? Yeah, and I'll give you my number too if you want to do that. I can, you can email me and I can kick you on to them. So. Okay, cool. Yep, so anyway, contact the local, whatever it is, just get some experience, get yourself known because it's a pretty small network of folks. And so someone in the Rochester area may call up and say, well, geez, you know, we got this open. You know, I remember there was this girl from Cass College that, she's from Rochester, she did a bunch of stuff and, you know, so it's it's good networking. Um, we do have seasonal positions with the DEC, typically during the summertime. Um, those are paid positions. And, uh, that's a good way to get in the door. And we do take on volunteer opportunities as well. So there's a bunch of different avenues to get into this field. There's a whole slew of federal agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, Geological Survey, Department of Agriculture. For us, it's you know, us in the Office of Parks and Historic Preservation. They have biology type positions. So do water conservation districts. They, of course, every county has multiple employees there. Not so much municipalities anymore. They tend to hire private consultants, as do the utilities, because it's why well, keep someone on payroll when they can just hire somebody to do a quick and dirty survey. And then, of course, academia. Someday you can be a prestigious soil scientist like Dr. York. In New York, DEC, our career opportunities, um, air, water, there's just dozens of things, ways you can go. And they're all based on that civil service exam. So if you do have something you're really interested in, say you're really interested in air quality, go on the website and there'll be a description of the jobs and there'll also be a course list of the, the qualifying courses you need to take in order to take the exam. So make sure to, if you're interested in all this now, I would get on there and check that and make sure that you can meet the qualifications. Pay is pretty good. These are old numbers. These are several years old now. The seasonal tech makes 17. Uh, like a biologist now pops out at 72, so it has risen. It's not, you know, you're not going to get rich, but it's certainly a comfortable living. So great benefits, super sick leave, lots of vacation insurance is great. Bad news, this is not quite so bad anymore because we've had just a flood of retirees since COVID came out. Um, but still, there's, you know, fairly limited jobs and the competition's pretty stiff because it is a great field. And the good news is, you know, we've had a ton of retirements, um, so our agency is down thousands of staff so we are getting ready to do a massive hiring push so you guys are in pretty good shape for career opportunities when you get done all right any questions we got three four minutes for questions 